All right. Good morning, everybody. Today is Monday, the 26th of October. Um, we have chosen to move to Chapter 10, MRS. And um, before that, though, up here is quote number 23. One should not let the grass grow on friendship's row. Okay, we'll start out with the guy side of the room. What's that mean to you? This guy's name is Cody, by the way. Turn around so they can see. First time you've seen the front of his head. They've always seen the back of your head. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a good answer. I hope everybody heard that. Want to repeat that? <laughs> and the ladies' side of the room, do you have anything else? Isn't, uh, okay, if, if you don't converse with people, or let's say, in this case, they use the word friendship, um, I'm going to use one of my classic examples again. Uh, I have a, a friend that we taught together for over 25 years. He lives in Hermiston. I live up here. And we travel the road between here and Hermiston quite often. We meet. We play golf. We have lunch. This week is his birthday. Uh, we go to the golf, you know, a lot of golf courses. Um, he likes to gamble a little bit, so I'll go with him to Wild Horse, those kind of things. Um, you know, it's kind of funny, uh, through the years, his wife and my wife, you know, we really don't socialize as a couple, but we do as a, f a friend, Bob and I. And that's why I got my Bob shirt on. I do have my Bob shirt on, you've seen it. Let's eat, Bob. Anyway, uh, it's something to think about. If you, uh, you had friends in high school, um, they don't go to school here? You still see them, and you still uh, continue. I know uh, sometimes you it definitely will make new friends, and uh, you know, look down the road. They say statistically, um, you will only have two or three really close friends. The rest will turn more like an acquaintance, but not quite that shallow. But keep that by. Interesting. Okay, um, we have a lot of things to cover the first day on uh, Emirates. Uh, uh, I would just like to start off with his dates. He, he was um, 1466 to 1536. How many years is that, quick math students? I know you love math. Well... 34, 70, that's my math, you can check it if you want, 70-ish. Okay, uh, he uh, lived and worked and raised all kinds of issues, and this is the Renaissance and the Reformation era, Renaissance, Reformation. Okay, um, he was born in Rotterdam, Netherlands. Uh, I, the only reason I brought that up is the area of Europe and the world at the time and how things were changing out of the uh, Far East, Near East, and Asia itself. Of course, we're looking at, you know, 1,400 years plus. So the whole world had changed. Uh, unique thing about him, he uh, went to four different universities, four different countries to be educated. Um, and you'll see by his works, 
that he put being educated, learning, continue to learn, continue to move in that direction is vital. And he really stressed that. Studied in Belgium, France, Italy, and England, for example. You know, some of the best universities uh, were in that area. Now, people sometimes labeled him as the leading light in the Renaissance. Uh, you know, the Chaucer, Shakespearean area, era, excuse me, uh, how things were done socially, quite interesting. They also gave him a label, uh, the father of the Protestant Reformation. Father of the Protestant Reformation. Now, uh, it's interesting how he got labeled that way, but uh, maybe through some of these characteristics, if you want to call them, uh, of him. Okay, uh, he opposed Protestantism. Uh, he protested the church at the time, the dominant church at the time was the Catholic Church, primarily because of, his, of the abuses. Now, he was raised and he was a Catholic, but he saw the inner works of the Catholic Church, and what was happening with the popes, and um, those things that the Catholic Church was cherishing and still do. Um, he was a very pious man. That means open-minded, though. He, uh, when he attacked something, he had his, as we would say, his ducks in a row. He had his information. He was educated uh, and spoke. Actually, I didn't say this but yet, but he spoke uh, three different languages and well-educated, as I already mentioned. Um, he saw, and he didn't uh, just pick on the Catholics, he saw the hypocrisy and the and secular, secularism. Whew, there's one of those words that French has trouble pronouncing. Um, he was often lucky during this period of time because people that stood out and spoke against the Catholic Church could become um, excommunicated, they could be put to death, they could be imprisoned, but um, as you read his praise of folly, uh, he hid a lot of his stuff, uh, like a lot of uh, apologists do, so he, so he wouldn't be attacked too harshly. People knew what he was hinting at. You know, some of the government people uh, couldn't pe pick up on it. And the way he spoke to people and the way he wrote, he did that. Uh, he believed you um, should harness yourself to God and his word. And above all, find the reason in, in the word. of the, the word meaning the Bible, the word, and... Um, the stories passed on down, the epic, epic tales that were told over time, but have a reason to understand those type of things. But harness yourself to God and, and what he represents, loving yourself, loving your neighbor, um, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Um, now, his most famous work, or written work is called In Praise of Folly. Um, in a quick one sentence, I guess, maybe two sentence summary, because we're going to go into that the next couple meetings. Uh, basically what he says, those being too broad for fundamentalism, and you guys should know, I'm pretty sure you do know what a fundamentalist is, uh, which, regret, which often rejects reason, and they're too honest, and they're sometimes too honest for the intellectualism, which rejects the revelation or the revel, uh, of the Bible, the ending story of the Bible. So you've got two mindsets here, the fundamentalists and the intellectualists. Uh, he says we need to find something in between and lot, not let it get us into trouble and deceive ourselves or take advantage. Um, 
So when he attacks the Catholic Church, uh, what the Catholic Church, how they use the money, the, the internal things, uh, why do we need gold domes, why do we need things um, outlined in gold or sprinkled with gold, why do our paintings or, you know, just the, why does the Pope need to take communion out of a gold cup? Why can't it just be a, a regular cup, like the common man? You know, he saw that as, you know, that's, that's not what it is. It's about God, not by, about the materialistic things that they have. Um, he was put in a, a, another status and referred to a lot of times because of his scar, scholarly intellect, and he chose things to be simple but have a pattern for step by step. And who have we talked about that that was his big thing? Everything must come in logic steps, remember? Pardon? Virgil was one, and actually two others all uh, thought about reasoning, do things in moderation, but have a, have a path step by step. You can't go forward without the, the step. You've got to do this step before you can go to the next step, uh, but there is an overlap. So with that in mind, he was put into, um, or often referred to as, um, because Martin Luther comes into this picture about halfway through his life. And Martin Luther was like 1480s, 83, somewhere right in there, uh, on up past his life expectancy. Uh, in anyway, it, with these guys in mind and how they were trying to change uh, with the Renaissance period going on in the Reformation and the change in the way uh, the church was looked at. Uh, they thought the church could be better. And uh, so they had to be uh, very, very, very careful. Now, um, some other things, uh, as you'll see when you reach, uh, when we start reading part of the praise of folly, he wrote in first person. And again, sometimes that is hard to follow unless you practice it a little bit. Uh, when he wrote and when he did speeches, uh, public speeches, or just storytelling, he often um, was there to inform you to watch out, look out, look at these things logically, and uh, it's going to affect your life. Uh, I'm already, let's say he's in his 50s at this time, and you're in your, your 20s and 30s like we are in this classroom. I'm a little older than 50, but you guys are in your, let's say, 20s, all of you. Not all of our students are, but a lot of them are. Um, and that you need to, uh, as Mr. French has adapted and adopted and adjusted his three A's, and that, that's kind of the thing <clears throat> that I get from a lot of these people. And, um, but his, his basic mission in life was to tell the people, to inform the people that change is going to happen. And if you want it to happen in the right way in the Christian world, I don't know what's over there. You distracted me. Uh, that you needed to follow this uh, as a logical story. We had a, a brief moment there, you guys. That's uh, okay. Uh, he went uh, so far as to say that he wanted to affect all Christians, and not just the Christians around him, that he wanted to see the whole uh, Christian uh, faith get back on track and stay. I want to say that there was a lot of corruption in the church, a lot, and it just kind of depended. Uh, 
you know, where, what part of Europe you lived in at this time, because the Renaissance, you know, and the Reformation, et cetera, were, were all centered in the European countries. It doesn't mean the other parts of the world weren't changing, too, but uh, this is the main emphasis. Now, um, he also wrote another uh, excerpt from The Praise of Folly, and it's called The Lady of Folly. It, it goes with it, and as we get to that point in time, you'll see that. But he adds The Lady of, of Folly like most of the people we've studied so far, there always seems to be a, a lady involved that, and if you notice the ones that were imprisoned, uh, you know, you can go back you know, to our last, you know, Virgil, they all, they all had a, a theme. And I cannot tell you why that is so, but it was just common style of writing in first person. Uh, a woman called Pauline is his lady of folly. Just keep that in mind or maybe write that down. Uh, and when you write in first person that way, you can blame it on your lady of folly, Pauline. Well, she, she's the one, not me, that's being sar sarcastic. Or she's the one that, that I will disguise my attack on the public or the Catholic Church in this case and the way society is behaving. Um, now, I don't know how much you guys know about the Catholic religion and its various uh, notions, uh, the way they, they uh, I want to use the word, operate and the, the policies. You know, like I was raised a Lutheran. Lutherans did certain things, and Presbyterian did certain things, but all of them were aimed at God. You know, you know that was the final, the seeing the face of God, aiming that way. Um, you know, we can go into other religions that didn't do that necessarily, but they had kind of the same format if you think about it. The Muslim faith, Islam, you know, they have. Mohammed, and um, you know you can you can go into what's the Bu Buddhist uh, theory. What is this theory? What is this theory? Uh, the Mormon theory. Uh, you got a wide range, but he was primarily centered on Christian and Catholic and uh, their notions and doctrines. Some of them he he did not accept and. Um, Keep that in mind as you read these. Okay, a um, couple more things, and then we'll be done with this section. Um, in his other works, I would like you to, uh, like you to write these down because they become uh, important to how he attacked every all the Catholic. Uh, he said, we, we should have these three journeys or three stages to our lives. Uh, and he, d he did separate works or writings, but he broke them into these three age group categories, uh, youth. And youth would be, in his realm, your teenage years down to your birth. And this should remind you of, an, of another guy that we that he had seven steps, if I remember right. But, and then uh, the journey itself, the 20-year-old to 50-year-old, uh, 50s, 60s, but definitely uh, 60 and up. Those are the three categories, and this is how he labeled. Youth spends more time on unquestionable praise and praying to God. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, things in my teen years, you know, oh, God, help me uh, pass this test, <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, uh, in comical, that's, but in seriousness, uh, praying with, uh, without thought, 
but there is thought behind it, you know. Uh, I can remember being taught the, the basic uh, the prayer, you know. Now, I, you know, just lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul. Uh, it's a little a prayer that my mom would always say. Um, then when you get into the journey section in your mid-years, 20s to 50s, you know, you, there you start breaking down things. And um, he chose the Apostles' Creed as his basic premise of everything. And if you, if you studied the Apostles' Creed or can remember it, you know, the, the Creed itself represents what the church is, should be all about and how it gets taken out of context. And then after you read, you know, you got to remember that the life expectancy, if you made it to 70 in his time, which he did, that's exceptional. So this is probably why the category is like this. Then he goes 60 and up was the third category, and this is uh, preparation for death. That's how he labeled them. Uh, the youth one again in review on praying to God, on, on the little, little, not sure how to put it, things that were just incidental that we took for granted, uh, little kitty stuff, but yet there was a serious side to it. And the second one, the, the journey in your middle, eight, uh, middle years and concentrating on the Apostles' Creed and what it meant to, to us, and then the third stage, preparing for death and to see the face of God. Now, um, the theme has, if you notice, the theme is the same throughout all his characteristics. He was pretty consistent, and I, and I think just from what I said to you guys, you can see that the logic of his, this is the way it should be, there's a reasoning for each of these steps, and this is how I'm going to tell you. Again, um, when we start on, on the praise of folly and lady of folly, um, you'll have this information to fall back on. Um, that's all I'm going to cover for today on that, and then we'll start. And so people out there in the video land, you need to uh, make sure you read the first part of the text and the last part like always, and then we get into the praise itself. We'll probably be, uh, again, trying to read some of it to you so you can understand it a little bit better. Any questions by my students that are present? Okay, well, let's turn off the video. And guys, uh, don't, oh, don't forget today was the due day for um, our last uh, chapter 8, wasn't it? All needs to be turned in today. If you haven't done so, a lot of you have already, but make sure you get it in. Thank you. Bye-bye.